Hello. Welcome to this presentation on sustainable groundwater management in agriculture, giving you an introduction on water in California. My name is Thomas Harder. I'm a professor and cooperative extension faculty at the University of California in Davis. I will give you an overview today of what it means to us in California that precious resource water that we all enjoy very much and of which we have a lot in some places in California. We have a lot of lakes, we have mountain snow, we have beautiful mountain lakes uh, that we love to use for recreation. We have an incredibly beautiful coast um, also used for much uh, recreation and a lot of urban areas nearby. But we also have floods in some years and drought in other years. And those droughts often come with huge fires following summers with little rain in the previous winter. And many of you probably have heard more about the fires in California than our water landscape. So when we talk about water, we really have to talk about precipitation and the distribution of the precipitation in this westernmost state um, in the continental United States on its southwestern border um, between the country of Mexico and the state of Oregon um, to the south and to the north and uh, west of the state of Nevada and the state of Arizona. Precipitation in this state is very unevenly distributed uh, we have most precipitation on the coast in the northwestern corner of the state. We also have a lot of precipitation in the mountains, uh, the Sierra Nevada and the Cascade Range, the coastal range along, along the coast of California. And we have very little precipitation in the desert southeast of this state. And so the landscape with that is very different from the lush forests of the northwestern coastal redwoods, through the beautiful Cascade volcanoes in Northern Central California, to the Alp Alpine mountains of the Sierra Nevada with its beautiful snowpack in the winter and gorgeous hiking country and wildlife in the summer, the lakes, and then we have the deserts in the Southeast. Now, while we have a lot of precipitation in California, that precipitation only falls during one or maybe two seasons of the year. Most of our precipitation falls between November and April. The months of May through October, we rarely see any sprinkles of rain. If there are, it would be over the mountains due to a thunderstorm. But much of the rest of California is really dry between April and October. So we have water some parts of the year and not in other parts of the year. We essentially dry out on a regular annual basis. But we also have a spatial disconnect between where water is generated in the mountains in Northern California and where water is used, which is in the urban areas around San Francisco and Sacramento and the urban areas of Southern California and also in these large agricultural basins, the Central Valley and the coastal valleys um, that have much of our irrigated agriculture. Those are the dry parts of the state and that is where most of the water needs are. And so we have to do two things. We have to store water from the winter months for the summer months. And then we have to see that we can get water from the north where it's wet to the south, where most of the water use happens. Well, to store water, one thing is really important to us, and that is the snowpack. That snowpack stores much of the winter precipitation from December through March and April, um, and it only uh, melts off in April, May, and June, feeds the rivers that come off these mountains that we also use for a lot of recreation and then fills the reservoirs that um, are ranked along the bottoms of our mountain ranges. Practically every canyon outlet from these mountain ranges 
is blocked by a dam behind which we have reservoirs where we also store much of that winter and spring runoff to then distribute that through canals to the water users in California. Here's another picture of some smaller reservoirs in Northern California um, that many of which are used for recreational uses, not just for storage. And then from these reservoirs, water is distributed through the river and channel network network and allocated to users through a complicated network of water rights. We have shared water rights among landowners that actually live along these rivers that eventually all go out to the ocean. We have many, many um, landowners that are not on a river that share a proportion of that river flow through what we call prior appropriation, essentially a system of seniority whereby a more senior water user re retains his or her water during a dry year while a junior user has to completely forego any water use. We also have environmental uh, rights in stream flows to protect uh, uh, specific fish species and other species of, uh, of concern um, and to maintain wild and scenic rivers. Much of that, uh, much of those environmental water rights currently are in this really wet part of Northwestern uh, California. Of the water use um, of the surface water that runs off of these mountain ranges in California, about 50% of the water rights are dedicated to environmental flows, about 40% are dedicated to agriculture, and about 10% are dedicated to urban areas. Now these agricultural urban areas, as I mentioned, are in the central and southern part of the valley, of the, of the state, and we need to bring water to them. Uh, to some degree, the rivers uh, do that job. We are lucky enough that the Sacramento River um, watershed covers most of the northern part of the state. We even tap into some of these rivers that go out to the northwestern part of the ocean. We tap into those rivers, build canals into the Sacramento River watershed and uh, bring flow in here all the way to about the just north of the middle of the state. And then from there, we build a system of uh, canals um, that deliver water from the rivers to the agricultural lands from the northern part of the state to the southern part of the state through an intricate uh, system of larger and smaller canals. These colored lines here all show you large water canal systems. And as you can see, those water canal systems parallel the Sacramento River. They um, bring water from the Sierra Nevada um, storage reservoirs, the dams that uh, are located at the bottom of the Sierra Nevada to the urban areas of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and we bring, we bring water through this canal system to our coastal basins all the way to Southern California, Los Angeles, and even San Diego down on the south end. We do have the Colorado River, um, which drains much of the southwestern United States. Um, from which we um, derive some water through canals that also feeds some of the Southern California uh, water uh, use demands. Now, much of that system goes through the delta, what we call the delta, the delta that has been formed by the Sacramento River coming from the north, the San Joaquin River uh, coming from the south in the Central Valley, and essentially filling what used to be an inland ocean with a deltaic structure um, that is home to a very sensitive ecosystem at the boundary between salty ocean water and sweet fresh water. Um, that, that system of, of um, estuaries and islands um, is very sensitive to water flows, yet we use that to essentially um, shovel water and direct water that's coming from the north through the delta, pump it into the canals on the south side of that delta that we then bring uh, to other parts of California. To the degree that this ecosystem um, is protected by environmental laws, uh, we have been working much for the last 50 years trying to balance the needs of water users in central and southern California 
with the needs of the environment, especially here in the Delta. Now, the other piece that we are challenged with here in California is besides this every year disconnect between the rain in the north and the dryness in the south, the rain in the winter, the dryness in the summer, um, both a spatial and temporal disconnect. We also have highly variable precipitation between years. Most of our average precipitation comes from very few storms. Some years we have a lot of those and we accumulate huge amounts of snow, uh, huge amounts of water is running off the mountains. We have huge floods in some winters and in other winters like the one that we just uh, are closing off, it, it looks more like this through most of the winter where much of the precipitation seems to evaporate before it ever hits the ground. As a result, the total precipitation total in our water years, which starts on October 1st and goes through September 30th, um, can vary from as little as 15 inches, which is about 45 centimeters, 450 millimeters on average for the entire state, to as much as almost 80 inches or about 200 centimeters, 2000 millimeters per year. That is a um, fourfold difference between the driest years and the wettest years. Um, one of the most variable precipitation areas in the entire United States. And this year happens to be one, on, one of those years that's on the, very much on the dry side following a year last year where we also had been on a dry side. So we're already now two consecutive years that are relatively dry um, following one year that was particularly wet in 2016, 2017, and then already 2017, 2018 was uh, dry. 2018, 2019, barely above average. So that's where we are. And with these two dry years, we're now looking at a emerging drought um, throughout not only California, but much of uh, the Western United States. And curiously, you can see there's parts of California that are extremely dry and parts of California that are only quote unquote, severely dry, which is the middle part and this Northwestern part. And that has to do with one single rainstorm event on January 27th and 28th this year, where we had these two arms of an atmospheric river hitting the central part for about 48 hours with enormous amounts of rains that kept uh, coming in from the Pacific. And the same thing um, here, uh, a second arm that hit the very Northwestern part of California. And that is reflected indeed on this drought map where those two areas have a slightly less drought impact than the other areas. With that drought, now we have to rely on, on something else other than the snowpack, which was miserably low this winter, not entirely gone, but miserably low. And uh, the fact that our surface water reservoirs really aren't quite full anymore, that they have limited storage um, and there will be limited amount of surface water available to water users this year. And so we have to go to another place to look for that water, and that place is groundwater. California has a highly variable geology. All the colors here, other than this beige color, are mountains. Uh, and we have lots of mountains in California. The Sierra Nevada, followed by the Cascade Range to the north, and the coastal, the coastal range all along the coast of California. And then we have the Basin and Range Province in the southeastern deserts. This beige or light yellow color designates our valleys, our large basins. These basins are essentially gigantic bathtubs where the bathtub walls are the rocks of the mountains that surround us. And in that bathtub, we have sediments that have been deposited by old seas or by rivers that came out of the mountains or by lakes that existed here, um, like an oversized flower pot. Uh, so the bathtub is filled with sediments and those sediments are wetted with water that's been recharged 
by the rivers when they first come out of the mountains that lose water, recharge water into the subsurface, um, and by precipitation that's not used by plants and percolates to groundwater, but also by irrigation on this landscape that returns some of it, its water back down to groundwater. This groundwater fills the sediments. It's recharged across this landscape, especially along the mountain front, and eventually discharges either into streams or into wells that dot the landscape today. So here you have rivers coming out of the mountains. When they exit these mountains, they fill the sediments in, uh, that are in these valleys with groundwater. And then uh, much later, that groundwater eventually oozes out along the bottom of these rivers just before they go out to the ocean. This is a small valley up in Northern California. You can see the uh, alluvial sediments. You can imagine the bathtub walls here. You can uh, imagine the alluvial sediments here. And these alluvial sediments are filled with uh, groundwater. Here you have another image of the Northern Sacramento Valley. Again, the bathtub walls that continue underneath filled in, in, in a bathtub filled with sediments on top of which we have um, our crops that we grow and the cities um, that we live in. This is a shot across the Central Valley from the coast range here in front of me to the Sierra Nevada to the east, a distance of about 100 kilometers from here to here with a valley that is about 60 kilometers wide, uh, a bathtub that's filled with about two to three kilometers of sediments and the upper kilometer of those sediments is fresh water that we can use for pumping and store in water towers, then distribute it to our urban areas. In response to that, the state in 2014 passed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, uh, or also known as SGMA, or we just call it SIGMA. SIGMA is based on two foundational principles. One is that groundwater shall be managed sustainably, meaning groundwater shall be managed in ways such that future generations can enjoy this resource much in the same way that we enjoy this resource today. That is the first principle and the first pillar of SIGMA. The second foundational pillar of SIGMA is that groundwater shall be managed not by the state, it shall not be managed by a few technocrats or managers. It shall be managed locally by uh, stakeholders, by all stakeholders in a democratic way, uh, whereby you have a local agency with a board that's elected um, that engages their stakeholders in the design and the decision-making of how to plan for a sustainable groundwater future. Uh, this is really important because other states that have had groundwater loss for a century or longer um, have chosen other principles for their groundwater loss. Uh, they may have chosen to depl that depletion of groundwater is okay. It just can't happen too fast. Uh, they may have chosen a more technocratic approach or a more centralized approach to groundwater management. Because groundwater management has been recognized as a very complex, um, a very complex issue that's embedded with surface water management, with water quality management, but also with land use, land use management and land use control, that it's best management managed at the local level. So following the passage of that law, we have established about 250 new agencies that now are responsible for managing groundwater. There are are in progress at the moment about 150 groundwater sustainability plans of which 50 have been completed and submitted to the state agency that is responsible for overseeing these plans and for overseeing these agencies. And you can see here these green areas are all areas that are either planning to have groundwater sustainability plans or that already have submitted groundwater sustainability plans. You can also see that there is a cluster of these submitted plans, and that has a reason. Those are the parts of the state that are most severely impacted by groundwater overdraft. Now, these groundwater sustainability plans, they are a balancing act. 
They are balancing the demands of a healthy economy, having healthy agriculture, healthy um, urban economy, with the need for um, uh, having a healthy population, with the need for having a healthy environment. Um, and that balancing act is one that is informed by knowledge, but where the decisions are made by the local people that are engaged in this process. And the balancing act is one of in increasing the supply of groundwater through additional research on one hand and decreasing where needed the demand of groundwater on the other hand. That decision-making process is first of all informed by knowledge of the hydrology, knowledge of the water budgets in the basin, by a lot of monitoring that is going on, by a lot of uh, data collection interpretation um, and the science to understand these systems. A lot of modeling is part of this, but it is ultimately decided by the stakeholders. So informing the stakeholders, educating those stakeholders so they can, make, um, they can make good decisions. They can come to compromises about balancing the environment with the healthy people and the healthy economic needs is very important. And as a result, we've seen not only many meetings now among these 250 agencies to deal with groundwater issues, we've also seen uh, many more outreach activities around groundwater, educating people on groundwater issues and what drives groundwater as a resource in the state. Ultimately, much of it is driven by some kind of a, what I call a fever thermometer that tells you whether you are healthy or not, right? What we call the sustainable, sustainability management criteria. Uh, essentially a uh, system of rulers or fever thermometers where we identify what we call unhealthy states or a minimum threshold below which we are unhealthy and a healthy state, what we call a measurable objective. And that applies in California, not only to groundwater levels or groundwater storage, but it also applies explicitly to preventing seawater intrusion, to preventing further degradation of water quality, to avoid land subsidence, which is one of our most costly consequences of groundwater overdraft. And perhaps importantly, also recognizes the, the uh, linkage between groundwater and surface water and makes sure that groundwater pumping doesn't unnecessarily deplete surface water. In order to manage groundwater, we have begun to engage in many different types of projects. In the agricultural arena, the new management practice that is um, emerging is um, winter flooding of agricultural land as a way to capture the large floods that we have in some years as a way to create new water that we can store in our large groundwater reservoirs. This planning and management process, of course, is an iterative process. We have 20 years to get to sustainability. The plans will be um, submitted, the 100 plans that not have not been submitted will be submitted by the end of this year. Um, and then we have a 20 year period with five year cycles where we design and implement and then monitor our success in terms of how well we're doing and react accordingly, um, perhaps replan some elements of this plan, re take another look at those plans and uh, make changes to the sign of our groundwater management. There's much guidance in the state available. Uh, the Department of Water Resources is the key technical uh, assistance provider, also provides funding to many of these local institutions to do these groundwater sustainability plans and implement groundwater sustainability plans. But they also have a regulatory role in that they are um, essentially um, looking at these groundwater sustainability plans and their implementation to determine whether or not they're appropriate. If they're not appropriate, then the State Water Resources Control Board, another water regulatory agency in California, takes over and enforces better sustainable groundwater management. With that, I thank you very much for your time and perhaps we will have an opportunity to meet in person one day. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to answer additional questions. Thank you very much.